An Eastern maxim says, a wife can abandon her husband if he goes to live where there are no apricots. The apricot is an irreplaceable fruit for those who have grown it for many millennia. It is not in vain that many debates have arisen as to the homeland of the apricot. An ancient legend tells that after Noah's Ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, that an apricot seed came out from a crack in the wood and rolled down from the peak of the mountain to the base. Here, on the plains of Ararat, first it germinated, then it bloomed and gave fruit. For this reason, the apricot tree is one of the first of fruit-bearing trees that blooms and gives sweet-tasting fruit. Among the many species of cultivated plants that have been produced by Indo-European peoples on the territory of West Asia, the apricot tree stands out first and foremost. Over the past 200 years, several debates have arisen about the beginning of the cultivation of the apricot in this territory. Many scientists, including the well-known vineyardist K.F. Kostina, conclude that the cultivation of the apricot took place far from the West Asian center of plant cultivation, but toward the east, in the center of origin of cultivated plants, more precisely, in the territory of current China. As a fruit, the apricot appeared in China 4,000 years ago. It is noted in historical records that the apricot was the favorite fruit of Emperor Chizhu, and that General Chang Qian brought the apricot to Central Asia in the first century before Christ. A great majority of researchers attest that thousands of years ago, dried apricots were an important part of the diet of travelers, reaching the territory of current Armenia. Today, in several nations of the Caucasus and Central Asia, as well as in Armenia, it is accepted to dry the fruit of apricots along with their pits. So in reality, it is interesting how it happened that the fruit became a tziran, because the word for apricot isn't Indo-European. But Armenian, as an Indo-European language, had to have a certain word. Yet a word that had roots in the Caucasus was used. This word probably goes back to prehistoric times. There is also another language of the Caucasus, of the Khuris, where the word for tziran might have come from. If not, the word could have come from Urartian times. But today, several people of the Caucasus use the Armenian word for apricot, and due to the apricot's importance in Armenian culture, everyone thinks the word is Armenian. But there are also certain facts stating that the area where apricots are grown was much larger than it is now, which is either due to climatic conditions or the indifference of man. Isn't it the case that the apricot tree is drought resistant and sun loving, yet doesn't tolerate the presence of other kinds of trees, the shadows and dampness existing in forests, and is harmed by fungal diseases? At the same time, the tree doesn't tolerate desert conditions. For this reason, the apricot has been maintained only in more favorable places. The fact is that the cultivation of plants has been going on for many centuries, I would say even thousands of years, done over the course of several generations of a nation. And it has become clear, of the 12 centers of plant cultivation, the one with the utmost contribution is the East Asian center of plant cultivation, this area stretching from the Arab countries to Iran. On the planet Earth, 60% of cultivated plants originated in the Asian region of plant cultivation. It is possible to say that the ethnic group that occupied this territory 
over the last 40,000 years, was able to develop a large amount of cultivated plants, which until now occupy an important place in the national economy of almost the entire world. We are deeply persuaded that this diversity of cultivated plants was created by one ethnic group, which were the ancestors of the Indo-European peoples. In Armenia, archaeological excavations have revealed the presence of apricot pits some 6,000 years ago. I'll say that the apricot pits found near Arani are from different varieties, considering the outer appearance of the pits, but there are pits quite similar to wild apricot varieties. We suppose that the apricots found in Arani are also wild, but of those wild varieties, there are apricot pits that are cultivated. From their outer appearance, I can also say that in Armenia, this cultivation took place in stages in the course of centuries, but from when and what varieties resulted from this, for now, we can't say. These are found in the context of the Copper Age. In other words, from that layer of time some 6,000 years ago, but of course the exact age needs to be determined. I can say that along with these plant varieties, there are others we have begun to study, of which we have done radiocarbon analysis and found out they trace back to the beginning of the fourth millennium before the birth of Christ, around 6,000 years before our time. Now concerning the apricot, what we are able to say is that this kind of research is very important for us, First in that, the apricot plays a very important part in our mentality and culture, as well as in our individuality. For this reason, it is very important to us to understand if this is the apricot that was grown 6,000 years before our time, and if so, if this is the same wild variety or not. Parallel with this, we have agreements with our colleagues to do laboratory research to find out if wild apricot varieties now growing on the territory of Armenia have a genetic tie with the wild varieties of the past, and if so, we can answer the second question, a long-lasting debate, if these apricots are the result of what was cultivated in the past, and then left uncultivated, thus again becoming wild. Then we will be able to tell the world if it is we who tended and cared for and are the source of this beloved fruit. In the 4th century BC, Alexander the Macedonian, returning to Greece from one of his campaigns, brought samples of a fruit from Armenia, naming it Armenian apple, or Malus Armenica. But in the 1st century BC, after capturing the second Armenian capital city of Ardashat, the Roman strategist Lucilos took with him apricot trees, which would later be named Armenian plum, or Prunus armeniaca. Today, also the scientific world calls the apricot Armenian plum, Armeniaca vulgaris, or Prunus armeniaca. As agriculture was at a highly organized stage, such must have been the level of the people of the time, who had to possess the idea of how to irrigate, prune, harvest, and all the rest. The people had to be, at the least, at this level. In the 4th century BC, in Armenia as well as in the entire area surrounding it, the culture of the masses was rapidly advancing, with our people and culture an indivisible part of this process. In other words, we should clarify, to bluntly put it, if this is our historical memory, that we associate ourselves to this extent to the apricot, or if it comes from more ancient times, happenings that took place that we love to talk about. And perhaps it isn't important which is the homeland of the apricot. The apricot is strongly connected with the culture and traditions of the Armenians. 
There are many artistic creations in different spheres dedicated to the apricot in literature, music, and the fine arts. The most important change which the apricot forced our people was to put the native word tziran into use. How was the word put into use? In reality, in Armenian, the word apricot, tziran, means purple-hued, bright purple, and the imperial purple, which was royal clothing. And you know that the apricot color and all these expressions are understood today as becoming one and the same as the fruit. But in reality, before the fruit existed, we had the apricot color, which means blue, sky-colored, and royal blue, which was the royal dress. Also the apricot flower and sea, which were sky-colored blue, as was apricot smoke, which was also blue. The rainbow was called apricot belt. There is also the word tsir, which means a common arc, and when associated with the sky, it becomes the Milky Way. From the root word tsir comes the word tsiron, or apricot. But with the influence of the culture of those working the land, the production of apricots captured such a high place in our lives that all of the previous expressions ended up coming from this word. Labored the sky, labored the earth. In between the two, the coral red sea labored in mirth, and the red bamboo too. So in reality, it is interesting how it happened that the fruit became an apricot because the word for apricot isn't Indo-European. But Armenian, as an Indo-European language, had to have a certain word. Yet a word that had roots in the Caucasus was used. This word probably goes back to prehistoric times. There is also another language of the Caucasus, of the Khuris, where the word for apricot might have come from. If not, the word could have come from Urartian times. But today, several people of the Caucasus use the Armenian word for apricot, and due to the apricot's importance in Armenian culture, everyone thinks the word is Armenian. For them, the word for apricot starts with a J, said Chiron instead of Tsiron. There are also a series of old, interesting sayings connected with the apricot. They say, wilted apricot for a lazy person. And for someone drunk, they say, He's an apricot. The harvesting of apricots is slowly turning into a ceremony, a ritual. For example, from place to place, the communities in different regions, in different altitudes, look and see whose apricots are ready to harvest, and then begin the process of shaking the trees and gathering fruit, in this way organizing to help each other communally. Then, this same group of people goes to another, higher elevation, where the apricots are ripening, and helps there. But if all this work is going on at the same time, day and night, trying to get this work done, that scene becomes very interesting, as people have the natural desire for their apricots to get ripe first. This is helpful because if the harvesting process is ongoing, there will be plenty of people to help. But if the apricots are ripe all the same time, Everybody will get busy with their own crop, and helpers will be few, not to mention there are obvious market benefits if the fruit is ripe early. You know, in the apricot culture here, an insect named bezez has come into being, and which helps the apricot to ripen. I don't even know what name biologists might have for the bezez, but we all know it by the name Tsiron Hasug, which means helping the apricot ripen. We know this ripening season is when the tsogo has to fill with water. You see, we have a name for an unripe apricot, tsogo. We have separate names for each stage of the apricot's ripening process. So we see that when the tsogo is ripening, that the tsiron hasuk appears on the scene. It is interesting that the essence of the word tsiron hasuk, bezez, means the insect that appears on the scene when the apricots are ripening. Therefore, the name of the insect is connected with the apricot. But the word Tsiron Hasug has a reflective influence and plays a definite part in our culture.
The influence is this. If we say, Siran Hasug, or helping the apricot to ripen, the people understand that the insect actually helps the apricot to ripen, and small ceremonies have arisen from this belief. They gather the small insects in their hands and set them free amongst the trees, scattering them everywhere so that the Tsiran Hasug will help the apricots ripen faster. This has ceremonial roots, as it would be difficult for that kind of game to arise on its own. What is the ceremonial meaning? Just gathering them and letting them go in the trees? No, because later the insects will just fly away. Now, they tie a string to the insect and wave it around, giving it to the children so they wave it by their tree. This will further help the apricots to ripen early. You know that the tree of life has many versions. As the season, when the apricot blossoms, it is like a new bride. Is it not true that the bride is fruitful just like the tree? With white clothes, decorated with flowers, as in the throes of labor.